Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. Uh, I do a lot of question shows, a lot of news shows here, but I also like to bring you behind the scenes, talk to the people who are actually making the news. And today I'm doc joined by Dr. Zach Putnam. Dr. Putnam, welcome to the show. Thanks, glad to be here. Well, the question I always ask people, who are you, what do you do? Well, uh, my name is Zach Button, as you said. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, so uh, I run a research group that does a lot of uh, space and also hypersonic mission analysis. Uh, my personal career background uh, before I was faculty was in entry, descent, and landing systems, hmm. um, particularly in guidance, navigation, and control. Uh, and uh, We've been uh, working in a variety of areas uh, related to guidance, navigation, and control for spacecraft and landing systems. Um, well, I don't know for pretty much my whole career, I suppose. Yeah, it's 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 tough, and we'll we'll get into that. We'll talk about that uh, later on in the in the show because uh, you know I think it's you know as as we're going back to the moon, as people are thinking about how they're going to get to Mars, figuring out entry, descent, and landing is the whole game at a certain point it's a uh, it's a really fun and challenging problem but. yeah yeah it really is so so but how you came across my radar was that you were part of a team that published some work on using pulsars as a navigation system so let's let's talk about this so so what's what was the research that you did uh so uh it's a little hard to, to know where to start. So one of the things, um, maybe we should start with sort of a definition of what is space navigation. Right? Sure, yeah. You know, you're, when you're in your car driving around, right, maybe you have a GPS or, or your phone on a little stand or something that gives you a map and tells you where you are, right? That's how you do navigation. Uh, in space, um, I mean, it's very pretty, but honestly, for the most part, there's nothing to see. You know, you can't look out your window and say, well, I just passed the grocery or these sorts of things, right? Uh, and so navigation, figuring out where our spacecraft is. Um, and as engineers, we tack on other things as well. We'd also like to know how fast it's moving and in what direction, all these sorts of things. Uh, it's much more difficult. Uh, so right now, how we do spacecraft navigation is we have ground stations on Earth, so radio telescopes um, and antennas, and we send signals out and they reach the spacecraft and they come back and by measuring what direction they are and how long it took them to get there and come back. And we can do some other fancy things too if you have more than one ground station. Um, but we use that information, we figure out where the spacecraft is and then we send that information to the spacecraft so the spacecraft knows where it is. The spacecraft can't actually figure out where it is on its own, usually. Right. Um, so uh, that's great, um, but um, what if you lose communication on your spacecraft? Which uh, happens quite a lot. It does happen. Yeah. And if you're in Earth orbit and it's a little satellite and it's going around and around, you're going to have lots of chances probably to pick it back up. Right? Um, but if you're out in deep space uh, and maybe there's a lot of risk in this mission, maybe it has people on board, we might like to have a backup system. Well, that's where, where this comes from. Uh, and so we've started to look at using uh, X-ray pulsars in particular uh, as sources of navigation information, uh, things we can observe and use that information to figure out where we are. So, and uh, the nice thing about them is they have actually the potential to be more accurate than our ground stations when we get very far from the earth. The ground stations we have depend on electromagnetic radiation uh, in some spectrum, um, S band, X band, et cetera. And the farther away you get from that ground station, um, the power of that signal falls off rapidly. Uh, so one over our squared law. And so at some point, um, using pulsars for navigation uh, may actually be quite a bit more accurate uh, than say ground stations in the deep space network. So why do pulsars provide a useful tool for navigation? Ah, so um, uh, if you're not familiar with what a pulsar is, it is a neutron star, which is a star that has gone supernova and then collapsed and it's the remnants. So it's gotten rid of some of its mass and the remaining mass collapses, uh, but angular momentum is conserved. And so it ends up spinning up um, really fast and so they're not very big you know say 20 kilometers across but maybe more mass than our sun mm -hmm. so very dense um, and spinning very quickly uh, and there's a couple of different kinds of pulsars but what unites them all is they emit signals uh, from their surface or electromagnetic radiation of some type 
Um, and because they're spinning, from our point as an observer, that signal looks like it's repeating over and over again. Um, and they can uh, go like hundreds that. of times a second. Like, it's ludicrously yeah. fast. Yeah, and in fact, for navigation purposes, we typically look at millisecond pulsars, which have millisecond periods, um, typically below 20 milliseconds. Um, there's reasons for that, but um, there are longer period ones as well. Uh, and so because they emit these regular uh, signals um, that we can observe and classify and keep catalogs of, which we have, uh, we can use those the predictability of those signals to figure out where we are, um, similar to the way you would use uh, GPS signals, actually at a high level, at least. And so, so sorry, so like a, <clears throat> if you're using a 20 millisecond pulsar, that is spinning 50 times a second, right? Mm -hmm. So that's fast. So the, the period of that signal is very short. Yeah, uh, right. And yeah. and so this signal that's coming, this, this I guess it's a burst of radio waves, mm -hmm. what does it take, I mean, to, to be able to detect it on a spacecraft? So that depends on the uh, band of the electromagnetic spectrum um, that you're in. Um, the first pulsars that were discovered in the late 60s, uh, we actually observed them on the ground using very large radio telescopes. Um, and the size of your telescope or your antenna that's receiving the signal is roughly proportional to the wavelength of the signal you're trying to observe. Um, and so for radio waves in that band of the spectrum, the wavelengths are quite long, and so you need a big antenna. Um, the reason we don't talk about using those on spacecraft so much is because, you know, the idea that we're going to fly a 10 or a 20 meter antenna on a relatively small spacecraft is yeah. sort of defies credibility, right? It's not that you couldn't do it, it's just a question of why would you buy it? It's, it's a little bit nuts. Um, the nice thing about X-ray pulsars is X-rays are have a much shorter wavelength. And so the antennas can be much, much, much smaller. Hmm. And so you're not, so even though the pulsar is giving off, you know, we think of pulsars as giving off these, these radio emissions that are detectable, as you say, with it, with a giant dish, they're also giving off an X-ray component of their burst as well, which is weirdly easier to detect with a smaller instrument. Right. Um, be careful about using the term easy. <laughs> yeah, I said easy. We're working, we're working I said, on it. I said, uh, yeah, sorry, I believe I said easier, but sure. So, yeah, uh, it's it will say we'll say more feasible for a, a spacecraft. Yeah, yeah. Um, the but like there's an instrument about, on board the International Space Station, right? The nicer experiment right. is ca is not very big, and it is producing amazing science about pulsars. So you can That's right. slap a nicer on anything, and and you're good to go. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, hopefully a, a more advanced version that uses less power and, and is even smaller than that. Right. But but yes, uh, and in fact, there's a sub uh, program of NICER called Sextant, uh, and don't ask me what that stands for. It's NASA, so it is an it's acronym. It's some acronym, yeah. Um, that was an X-ray pulsar navigation demo um, that happened a, a couple years back. Uh, so we have we have actually done this in space, uh, used uh, X-ray pulsars for navigation. Um, but the, I was going to say the thing to remember about pulsars is they're not a it's not a uniform bunch, right? These are natural phenomena, um, and so there's lots of pulsars out there. We're still finding new ones, um, and there's different types. Um, there are rotation-based pulsars, there are accretion-based pulsars. Um, X-ray pulsars tend to be the accretion type, um, where you actually have this spinning neutron star, and it's actually pulling mass from a lower mass star near it. So it's a binary system. Um, and since it's pulling mass, it forms an accretion disk around the spinning pulsar. And where that accretion disk touches the pulsar, there's basically a hot spot on the surface that's emitting a bunch of energy. Hmm. Um, and so X-ray pulsars, at least so far, uh, tend to be of that type. Oh, um, interesting. Okay, so it's not just the the standard neutron star that's rapidly spinning and blasting out those those radios because of some magnetic yeah, field. So, so it so it is, it is rapidly spinning and it is blasting out the stuff, but sure. the source is a little bit different. Um, right. And because of that, so uh, sort of a, when you think of a regular um, pulsar, right, you think of it's, it's spinning and, and in general, you know, because of conservation of energy, it's gradually spinning down because it's emitting energy. But with accretion-based pulsars, um, some of them actually are spinning up because they're <laughs> absorbing the angular momentum from this other star. And some of them are spinning down. And we've even observed ones that have switched. 
Huh. Uh, but it is all still pretty stable, uh, at least enough for us to use for navigation purposes. Right. For hundreds or thousands of years. Right. They're roughly similar. Yeah. So so you've got these 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 bursts of x rays that are coming in our direction, you're detecting them with some instrument on board your spacecraft. What are you detecting that allows you to figure out your position? Ah, yes. Um, so uh, you could think of these as uh, regular wave. Well, regular is a bad word to use. Um, think of it as just a, a wave incoming and the wave repeats, right? So it has some period. Right? So a simple wave just for visualization purpose, maybe you think of like a sine wave or something like that you know, from uh, trigonometry. Uh, and by measuring the timing of when photons arrive on our sensor uh, that are you know, in the X-ray spectrum, um, we can timestamp each photon that comes in so we know when it arrives. We can stack them all up and we can try to reproduce the wave from basically, reproduce the wave. Um, and if we know when it arrived, um, and we also have some reference point elsewhere where we know where they arrived, um, then we can tell say, well, at that time, we were here on the wavefront. And at that time, at the reference point, we were over here. Yeah, this way. Right. There we go. Right. <laughs> uh, and we know how far apart those are, right? It's, you know, we can, we can change time and, and distance because it's all, it's all this, all these signals, all these photons are going to speed of light. Um, we can figure out how far apart they are. The trouble is, uh, we don't know if we're on this wavefront here or the next one over here or the next one over here, right. or the next one over here. So we know that we are X distance from some reference point plus some integer multiple of the of the wavelength, if that makes sense. And the X-ray wavelengths are incredibly tiny. Right, um, which is good and bad. Hmm. Um, it's good because that means that we can use them to be relatively precise. Um, it's bad because there's a lot of wavelengths between us and the reference. So the trick then is, well, which wavefront am I on? I know where I am on the shape, but I don't know because it repeats. I'm not sure which one I'm on. So basically, if I observe one pulsar, I can say I am, um, you know, I might be, uh, say, three kilometers plus one wavelength uh, from the um, uh, reference point, or I might be three kilometers plus two wavelengths, or three kilometers plus four wavelengths, et cetera, some hmm. major number of wavelengths. And if you think about that in space, that basically means there's some infinite set of planes um, that I might be on. I can't be between any of them, but I could be anywhere on those planes. Compared to that and one, to the, compared to that, that one pulsar. That's observing one pulsar and one reference point. So if I observe a second pulsar, I could also be anywhere in some set of planes for that pulsar, but I still have to be on the set of planes for the first one. Mm -hmm. So now I know that I'm somewhere where I'm on the plane of the first one and on the planes of the second one. So if you take a whole bunch of stacked up parallel planes and intersect two sets of those, you get a set of lines, right? I'm somewhere on one of those lines. Um, if, I inter if I observe a third pulsar in a different direction, now I don't have lines anymore. I have a set of points. That could be any of those points. And if I observe a fourth pulsar, um, then there's fewer points. And a fifth pulsar, there's fewer points, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, you know, in my sort of rough understanding was that you are observing these pulsars and detecting the the wavelength of the pulsar, you know, the way I mean, pulsars are used all the time for this kind of for any kind of, you know, you could detect gravitational waves, thanks to pulsars, because of the just the absolute perfection that you get these signals coming to you. And then you can detect planets around them, because you're getting some kind of redshift from the radial velocity change. So my assumption going into this is that you're detecting redshift coming from these pulsars, but that's not what you're doing. Is that what you're, is, is that what you're saying? That's correct. You do need to correct for that. Um, I will add, um, right. You know, there's, there's a, there's a whole bunch of work that's been done on, uh, estimation theory and, and things like that to actually reconstruct, uh, these wavefronts. Um, our work hasn't so much been focused on that though. Um, We've really been focused on uh, how we can use X-ray pulsars to solve what we call the cold start problem, um, which is, let's say you're you're on a spacecraft, um, 
and you have a problem, uh, communication loss, and you don't know where you are. And so you wake up, the computers come back on, and you're like, well, where am I? I need to know where I am, right? So at minimum, so maybe I know where to point my antenna back towards Earth to get instructions, or maybe I have some big event coming up, like a, like a maneuver, and I need to know where I am so I can put my rocket engine in the right direction, that sort of thing. Um, so how do I figure out where I am if I don't have any prior information? Um, and what we figured out that is if you observe enough pulsars, uh, um, you can uniquely determine your position uh, within some finite size volume of space. Um, and it turns out that that volume of space actually can be quite large, as in like perhaps the entire inner solar system. Right. That's uh, not very helpful. Yeah. So it's, it's great, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and we're we're still we're still working on refinements of things, but um, we haven't we've I think shown that it's that it's feasible. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so that's that's the big deal is that we can actually determine our position in space without having to call home. Right, right. Now, now, you know, I had done a video, I'd done some research into this, into the into the nicer experiment, and I recall that they were able to determine the position of the International Space Station because of the nicer. This is this X-ray detector designed to scan for for pulsars, and maybe it was with the sextant experiment that you were mentioning. Yep, that's it. To the level of accuracy that they were getting from the GPS network, so so they were able to get their navigation system to that same degree of, of accuracy. But I'm not sure whether it's because they were using, you know, whether it was it wasn't the cold start problem. No, um, and so. Most work on X-ray pulsar navigation is what we would call like the position update. So if you remember just a few minutes ago, I was talking about, well, you get this set of points um, if you had never the pulsars, right? And there's more than one. So the question is, well, which one am I at? And if you know that, well, an hour ago I was here, so it's going to be the closest one, right? I'm not going to have suddenly traveled to Neptune kind of thing, right? Um, and if you're in Earth orbit, you know, you can you can figure these things out. Um, uh, okay, so, be, so in other words, if you're orbiting around the Earth, there is a very precise pathway that you are probably following. Right. And so, so if you're you detecting sort of, I, your pulsars, then you can get a sense of where you are on that. Yeah, I, I knew where I was, you know, some at some earlier time, right? And there's only so far that I could have gone, especially if I know something about my velocity and where I'm at. Right. And so that can point me towards which one of those many points is the correct one. Uh, the trick that we've been working on is, well, what if I don't know where I was? Mm. Right? And how do I figure it out? Um, and, and I would say, too, you know, the, to be in all fairness to, to GPS, right? Um, it's notoriously bad at estimating altitude. <laughs> yes. Uh, right? Can confirm. It's, it's yeah. primarily designed uh, to operate for people on their surface, right? So it's maybe not 100% fair to... To ding it, especially for something like the space station, right, which is zipping around the Earth at seventeen thousand miles an hour. Right, much closer to the GPS satellites than than we are down here on the surface of the Earth. So, so let's go back to this idea then. So, so based on your research, you were what level of accuracy were you able to get, sort of spatially? Uh, it, it's pretty highly variable, um, but certainly within tens of kilometers. Wow. Which if you're talking about, you know, trips of hundreds of millions of kilometers, it's not too bad. You know, it's it's not good enough for everything. Right? If you're going to do a precise uh, orbit insertion burn, say at Mars, or, or if you're trying to set your vehicle up for entry, descent, and landing, um, you probably need to do better than that. Um, but it's probably good enough to get you started. And once you have a rough idea of where you are, uh, you can observe higher frequency pulsars, for example. Um, to refine that position. So the nicer sexton uh, experiment observed pretty high frequency pulsars. And the closer those wavelengths are together, right, the, the, the more um, granularity you have in your measurement uh, in terms of position. Um, but we found for trying to figure out your rough position when you have no information, um, you actually want um, longer wavelength, longer period pulsars, um, because it cuts down on the number of potential locations, even if it's less accurate. Oh, because you've got those slices that you're trying to, right. to line You have fewer up. slices in the same volume of space. Uh, so 
and and um, does but your... the, the, the flip side of that is is that that means you know the bigger the wavelength the less accurate your position is um so we did some work in, in terms of sort of trying to select pulsars intelligently to solve this problem because they come in all different directions and, and all different uh, wavelengths and there's not infinite choices available because these are signals of opportunity, right? Nature created these. We have to do with it. It's not like a GPS satellite where we picked yeah. it, yeah, and designed it such that this would be an easy problem to solve. Um, uh, and we found that generally you want pulsars that are, in terms of initial position determination, you want them that are actually have close, small angular separation and long wavelengths. But to be accurate, you actually want big angular separation, so coming from, say, orthogonal directions, um, and small wavelengths. So there's a trade-off there between you know, what you do. And we, we actually got a pretty good results of starting with to observe pulsars with long periods, and then towards the end, switching over to some higher frequency, shorter period ones to improve accuracy while still solving the problem. And is that what got you to that tens of kilometers level yeah. of accuracy? Yeah. <clears throat> so then what is the the limitation do you think is it is it the detector is it the calculation or is it the pulsars do i need to go out and make more pulsars yeah so uh there's a few things um you know this this isn't magic um i mean i think it's really cool uh but there are some some trade-offs right this is not like a you hit the button and you get your position estimate um when you're observing x-ray pulsars uh, the signal to noise ratio is very low which means if you have a, an X-ray detector and you're registering all the incoming photons and you know what direction the pulsar is, so you actually point it in the right direction. Um, that's a big first step. Um, most of the photons you receive in that spectrum will not be from that pulsar. They'll be from other sources, background radiation. And so the trick is, how do you figure out which photons, <laughs> which X-rays came from the pulsar and which ones came from something else that you don't care about? Uh, so that's trick number one. And the Net implication of that is you have to end it, you end up having to observe it for a relatively long period of time to capture enough photons to uh, accurately reproduce the wavefront and be able to figure out where you are uh, to some, you know, to, to some acceptable degree. Um, and so that's measurement times per pulsar on the order of hours to days, depending on how precise you want to be. And you wanted four, five, ten. Yeah. So pulsars. now you talk about, well, I want to observe six pulsars, and that could take a week. Um, now, if you're a spacecraft on your way to Neptune, you got time. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you. <laughs> That's a you know, 10, 15 year trip. So maybe it's not a big deal. Um, if you're near some kind of critical event, you know, that may not be in the cards. Um, we have done some more work recently, which isn't out yet, um, that shows that we can still do pretty well um, with. Uh, shorter observation times and shorter accuracy um, in terms of you know how well we can reproduce the phase of the signal basically um, and so that will help and I, I think there's room for improvement in our observation techniques and, and detectors and things like that um, anyway so so that that long measurement time for pulsar is is, is drawback number one um, drawback number two is we still need a clock um, and we still need an accurate clock um, now we've made a lot of advancements recently in um, precision timing for spacecraft. Uh, the Deep Space Atomic Clock Project yeah. uh, that NASA ran uh, a few years back. Uh, and that's not something that most people really think about, the importance of timing um, uh, for spacecraft, but it's super important. Uh, and the drift on those clocks is like nothing. Yeah, seconds uh, <laughs> over the age of the universe at this yeah. point. But, uh, but the miniaturization, like you can have a... A very accurate clock that sits down here on Earth. It's it's the putting the accurate clock in space, a and, tiny little that's, clock. That's the and that's that's, the that's typically where where NASA inserts itself in the technology development. Actually, is taking something that's working on Earth and making it small and reliable. Um, and so we have those types of clocks. Um, the more difficult part is dealing with, um, well, essentially dealing with special relativity. Uh, so we're moving fast enough and these wavelengths are short enough that we have to correct um, for our, how time is moving a little bit differently on our spacecraft um, than it is, say, at our reference point, you know, the Earth or the solar system area center or something like that. Um, but there's nothing that looks like we can't do that right now. Uh, so um, the last thing is... Uh, 
there's a fair amount of compute power required to go compute these all these positions over over you know large volumes of space. Um, that said, uh, flight computers are getting faster, albeit much more slowly than than consumer electronics. Um, and the long measurement time horizons, I mean, that takes longer than the compute. Um, because it takes so long to observe them, the compute time is sort of washed out. Right. You're computing um, as you go. You've got, you're waiting for those observations. You've got time. To assuming you have, you know, some kind of relatively modern uh, flight computer, like the, the NASA um, uh, HPSC concept, which is a, well, it sounds pathetic, but it's like an ARM Cortex A53 quad core processor, right? Which right. I don't even know if, if you can get. It's a smartphone, an old smartphone computer a very old smartphone which yeah. is better than right now i mean you know the perseverance rover has a, a 200 megahertz power pc chip right which is something you could have bought in a macintosh computer in, in 1997 right uh, <laughs> yeah so we, we it is getting better um, but yeah so then i mean if you and then it, it, i guess it's all coming back to mass then right like like i'm sort of imagining some future instrument that is shaped like its detectors are shaped like the positions of the pulsars themselves and it is receiving it, it uses some kind of plate solving to just orient itself so that it's getting the data streams into the different detectors and then it is simultaneously gathering data from all of those pulsars yeah and then running the calculations at the at the same time like, is that sort of the, the final version of this technology? I mean, that would be awesome. Uh, you, know, you know, right now where we're at, we're, we're talking about single detectors. Yeah. And if I want to do more than one pulsar, I've got to rotate my spacecraft every time right. I want to look at a different one. Um, and, you know, that's, that's not infeasible. We do stuff like this all the time um, for other instruments. Um, I mean, I think about the going... Sloan Digital Sky Survey where they drill little holes in their plates and then run fiber optics from each each piece of fiber optic relating to a individual galaxy that then they're able to bring that in and and you know, they obscure right. the rest of the, of the sky but but x-rays are not tamed in the same way as as regular photons i don't know do x-rays go down fiber optic cables i doubt it uh, i mean they can the, the trouble with with x-rays is the more sensitive detectors typically need cryocooling um right so we just added a cryo cooler to the spacecraft as well which makes life more difficult right yeah. then you probably don't want um a fiber optic cable um between your detector uh and the source yeah um but you know detectors are getting better too and the idea that we could have an instrument um that has say multiple independently steered um detectors or mirrors uh, uh that, that work with these types of signals is, is that's not outside the realm of possibility. So we what have do you those systems right now, but yeah, and we have yeah. actually looked at the impact of having to observe pulsars sequentially versus being able to do them all in parallel. Um, and if you can do it in parallel, it's much easier. And, and so, what do you think is the sweet spot? Like, you know, as as an engineer, you're always dealing with trade offs. And so, imagine we're twenty years in the future. You've got a fast computer. You've got NASA has been helping to provide you miniature clocks and miniature uh, X-ray detectors. What do you think a standard and and it is you know and it seems like it's feasible enough that even as a backup, you put one of these on a spacecraft to give you so you never lose lose contact with the spacecraft again. What do you think is the sort of a feasible capability of a of a of a package like this? Yeah, I mean, the, the um, as a standalone package, uh, it could certainly operate as a backup system for high value space missions. And in fact, that's how we got into this work, um, was working with some colleagues down at Johnson Space Center. And, and their vision of it is as a backup navigation system for high value crewed missions, um, in particular deep space ones. And, the, you know, the only really considering at the moment for human beings is Mars, although asteroids have been in the mix you know, relatively recently as well. Um, the other big use cases, I think, um, one is when you get out past about 15 astronomical units from Earth, 15, 15 times the distance between Earth and the sun, 
um, X-ray navigation um, starts to be more accurate than ground-based navigation using hmm. deep space, at least with current technology. And uh, because the accuracy of X-ray navigation, although it's not as good maybe in the inner solar system, it doesn't fall off with distance from the Earth. It's relatively flat. Um, there's a small fall off, but it's it's short. It's um, it's not much. Uh, so if we're talking about uh, outer solar system missions, um, this starts to become really, uh, really good. Um, it's really good for other reasons too. Um, if you're out at <laughs> You know, far away from the Earth, and you're trying to do uh, navigation. Uh, it takes a long time for those signals to go back and forth. Um, and again, the farther you get, the lower the signal power is, and the more time you need on the deep space network. Uh, the you know, set of three deep space observation stations that NASA maintains. Um, and if you know anything about the deep space network these days, you probably know that it's oversubscribed. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you know. Even if you have an XNAV system on board, you know, it may not be a backup, but it may be supplementary. Maybe it means that you only have to call home every six months instead of every week. Uh, maybe it's an update, right? Or if we start talking about sending lots and lots and lots of spacecraft uh, far away from the Earth, which people talk about, and I think credibly at this point in time, what if they could all just be autonomous and they didn't have to call home unless they wanted to send data back? You know, this is the kind of thing that would enable that. But there's two parts to it. Like when I think about your your crewed spaceship, and they go off course, somehow. Um, and it, it, it makes total sense, you know, they're a tiny little dot in a vast ocean of the sky. And you're pointing your radio dish at where you think they should be. You're not receiving any signal from them. They're trying to transmit back to home, but the, the radio dish to transmit with them is not pointed at them. But they know, I mean, I'm sure on their spacecraft, they know to point their, their dish at Earth. So half of the communication is trying to, to make contact. Um, but you don't well, but you Earth get, doesn't you know get. where to point. And I guess the question is like, how can an onboard navigation system help Earth know where to point if they can't transmit their position? Yeah, so it won't ever help if it's on board the spacecraft, it won't ever help anyone on Earth know where to point. And in fact, we can probably track them passively. Um, we just wouldn't be able to tell them where they are, which doesn't help the spacecraft, right? At some point, the spacecraft has to execute the mission, has to do the maneuvers, right? Right. Uh, and so what the system would do would tell the spacecraft where it is. Um, and if you're far away from Earth, it's not readily distinguishable uh, from other things. If you're at the moon, sure, you can look up and be like, oh, let's point it over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, even if even if it's the Earth is is almost totally dark, you can see a big black spot right where there's no stars. Right. Uh, you get far enough away, and that's not the case. It's We have good capabilities in terms of determining what direction our spacecraft is pointing. But if we don't know where we are, we don't know where Earth is relative to us. Right. Okay. So you've got this, this, this mission, the, you know, the crew have gone off course, uh, they're on their own and they're coming to a very important window when they need to fire their thrusters to either not crash into Mars or not just fly past Mars. They want to go into an orbital insertion and they've lost contact with earth because they're off course and earth doesn't know how to communicate with them. This right. allows them to properly execute the entry burn mm -hmm. without yeah, you know, without that yeah. regular contact with Earth. Yeah, the you know the use cases we we've spent the most time thinking about really are the deep space ones. Because um, to be honest, if you get close to a planet, close to Mars, um, there are other techniques we can use to do positioning uh, using optical navigation systems um, that work pretty well as well. Um, that can supplement uh, other information. Uh, so you know we may or may not need XNAV in that case, um, but when you're out far away and there's nothing to look at other than the stars, the stars can tell you what direction you're pointed, but not where you are. Yeah. Uh, um, then it starts to be a lot more handy, right? And and maybe, you know, we're using the forest to figure out where we are so that we know where to point our antenna so that we can talk to Earth. You know, maybe it's as simple as that. Um, uh, or maybe it's just uh, enabling a greater degree of autonomy on spacecraft or making it so that uh, uh, we're reducing burdens on Earth-based infrastructure, things like that. 
Um, or in the case, like I said, of outer solar system missions, um, actually getting better navigation accuracy than we could get from talking at home. Right, right. Um, so, so let's sort of scale this forward, you know, maybe in, in, you know, I guess like my hope is, or my dream is that you could have just some little box that you attach to a spacecraft that is standard issue in the same way that a, I don't know, any, any part of a spacecraft is standard issue. And that's just your navigation array. And you just bolt it on the side of your spacecraft. And now any spacecraft equipped with that, as long as the system is functioning, will know its position within a level of accuracy that is useful for, for the mission in terms of interdescent landing, orbital changes, etc. Um, do you think this is the path? I think it is a promising path. Um, you know, we always have to be a little bit careful with uh, prognostication. Uh, it's I, okay. No one's I, no one no one listens to this. Don't worry about I, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No none, of, um, none of your I, funding agencies are are listening. Nobody from NASA. This is this is fine. I I think uh, I think it's promising. Right? There are plenty of questions that still need to be answered in terms of miniaturization, in terms of sensors, in terms of processing algorithms. Um, there will always be an impact on the spacecraft itself, right? It's not It's never going to be a magic box, right? It's going yeah. to say, well, it'll work, but you got to make sure your spacecraft is pointed in the right direction kind of thing, right? But making um, your spacecraft point in the right direction seems like a vastly easier problem to solve. You just plate solve. Like we do that with telescopes I, all the time. I, I agree. Um, yeah, okay. but, you know, when you're working on a... <laughs> When you're working on a flight project and you tell them that you want to point the spacecraft in this way to do navigation, you got to go fight with everybody else for time to do that, right? So you know those things do happen, but it, yeah. you're right; it's a solvable problem, and yeah. we do that. I mean, I think like DS one had a Starfinder on board that allowed it to autonomously position itself. Like again, this feels like a fairly well solved problem. But, D space but, missions, we, we almost always have a star tracker on board yeah. or a star camera, right? Um, but that doesn't tell us where we are. It just tells us what direction we're right. Going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's that's common hardware. Um, and I mean, that, that's what I think of as, as, as X ray navigation, pulsar navigation coming into its own is when it's at that level. Yeah. But I can go to X aerospace company and say, you know, I want a, I want a three sensor, uh, uh, we call it X nav, X nav array. Yeah. Just like a star tracker, right? Yep. And there'll be accommodation requirements on the spacecraft, just like a star tracker, right? There's, there's things like that, but it won't be anything out of family with any other navigation hardware that we can currently use, right? And I, I, I haven't seen anything to make me think that, that isn't possible. Yeah. Um, and I think the use cases are there and getting more compelling as we want to send more spacecraft and autonomy becomes more important. So and someone in the chat is is just saying that this kind of reminds them of an R2D2. So if you could like call it an astromech, give it you know, a sort of, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, maybe we just need better shape. branded. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and have give a little wheels and then it can run, you know, and talk. And then you can just sort of have it sit inside your spacecraft and it provides you with your, with your, uh, navigation system. I mean, it, I guess like if this, you know, I'll be, I guess, you know, no, I know way less. And so I get to be ignorant about this. And yet it seems to me like it's a, it's a very promising direction to go if if pulsars x-ray emissions from pulsars don't end up being what you hope they be are there other ideas for autonomous navigation or position that you think might be possible yeah are there yeah. Other natural uh, phenomena out there that we could tap into that could give us location so a lot of that depends on where you are and what you're trying to do uh, as i mentioned uh, you know a little while back, you know, doing uh, vision-based navigation uh, or optical navigation, depending on exactly what the application is, the community uses slightly different terms. I know, I know, you know, the all the UAV folks talk about SLAM. Um, uh, you know, the landing folks when they use vision navigation tend to talk about you know a VNS, a vision navigation system. And the, the in-space folks talk about OPNAV, optical navigation. So if there's something close by some celestial object and we know what it is and we can look at it, uh, that can give us a ton of information. 
and can be highly accurate um, if we have a good enough camera and, and the right algorithms on board, which, which, and those are technologies we have today. We just haven't really been using them very much. So in this case, the spacecraft is, is looking around itself and going, there's, there's earth, there's Mars, there's Uranus, there's Ceres. I think I know where I am. Um, yes. Or if you're close by, like say I've got the view, like your background right now, and I can say, well, there's the limb of the earth. Um, I know where that should be. Yeah. And I can see what it looks like from right here and I can match it to some onboard stuff and I can figure out you know, how far away I am and what direction I'm pointed at and maybe where I am. Uh, so that that's one, I think, promising option. I think that is going to happen, uh, for, for close in types of navigation things. Um, you know, beyond that, if we get serious about infrastructure investment, it's not hard to imagine some kind of a, a space oriented communication network, right? Uh, so like some it, human built pulsars in the, yeah, in, the, in the solar system. I mean, I, I've seen, you know, pulsars are, are sometimes in the navigation side of things referred to as like lighthouses, right? Because they spin just like a lighthouse and that beacon. It's a nice analogy. Um, but yeah, maybe at some point we start building our own lighthouses, so to speak, in space. Like, it's essentially what GPS is, um, uh, you know, for regions that are um, not just right around, uh, right around the Earth. Uh, certainly, I've seen proposals for building similar systems on Mars um, and the Moon. Uh, you know, those are localized systems, uh, but there's no reason to think that we couldn't build out something larger um if we had the will and the and the need uh, the nice thing about xnav i think relative to that is it's not one of its hallmarks is not infrastructure intensive it's a right. single system that operates independently you know if we built out a huge gps we wouldn't call it that probably um uh, for say the inner solar system you know that would be expensive um yeah. it would also probably be very accurate uh so yeah. We'll see what the future holds. And, That's interesting. Uh, what direction things start going. And and maybe in terms of depends, you know, if it is a crewed mission, maybe you kind of want redundancy. You have both. Right. As a backup. Um, right. What if, you know, let's go way into the future and think about navigating ourselves across the galaxy. How, you know, do you, how useful, like if you picked up one of these systems and dropped it in Alpha Centauri, would it know where it was? Uh, that would be much more difficult. Um, I hesitate to say impossible. Um, but doing navigation using X-ray pulsars is predicated on the fact that we know the signals and we know the directions they are, right? Um, and things in, you know, in space are far enough away from the solar system that pretty much anywhere we go in the solar system, or even in the outer solar system, or even out, you know, where Voyager is, uh, or New Horizons, right? You're not going far enough such that those directions are gonna change significantly. If we start, start, start talking about, you know, going many light years away, um, it's not that we couldn't do it, um, but we would need to have updated catalogs um, that took that into account, basically. Right. And I think, you know, that's, that's a problem I think we could solve um, but I, just as, as a, as a, as a quick example, um, and this is something I glossed over, um, if you have a, a beacon emitting a signal, um, in space, it actually comes out as a sphere, right? An ever expanding sphere. Um, we typically, you know, when we were talking about this, we talked about infinite sets of planes. Um, they're actually not planes. They're curved a little bit. you do need to take that into account. It just makes the math nastier. Conceptually, it's the same. Um, and the farther you are away from said reference point, the more that curvature becomes important. So if we talk about you know, traveling off to Alpha Centauri or to the other side of the Milky Way, then, you know, that becomes very important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so some knowledge of that. And so would your, I guess your spacecraft would first have to, like, are pulsars do they have a fingerprint? Like if yes. I if I showed you the the signal of a pulsar, yeah. you could say, "Oh, I know, I know that, I know that one." 
Um, yeah. I mean, I, I personally could not do that, but I could look it up in a catalog and be like, yes, yes, they are unique. Right. Um, uh, and so that's also really helpful. And so um, in theory that your spacecraft could first map out the location of all of the, the, right. the pulsars, get their fingerprints. Well, and, and if you think about, say, a, a spacecraft that's traveling from uh, our solar system to someplace very, you know, a, a nearby star or uh, outside the galaxy, right? That trip takes even you know, even if you're going at science fiction speeds, takes some finite amount of time. Uh, and during that time, you could be observing these things and updating your catalog and model as you go. Right? Yeah. And you know, one of the one of the things about pulsars is we know pretty well what direction they are from us, it's much more difficult to estimate how far away they are. Um, and so if we move far enough away, we can we can figure out what the new direction is going to be, but not if we don't know where it is. Um, like we need the other part of the triangle to so figure that out. But if you are consistently observing them during your flight, during your travel, right, each time it would just move a little bit, you track that, then you could figure that out. Right, right. And also learn the distance of the pulsar while you're at it with great accuracy. Right, which would be actually a big help. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> super astrometry. Um, so then, but then if you, I mean, I'm just sort of like envisioning, like, you know, say you're going to write some science fiction story. Is this the basis of your galactic navigation system, that there are these natural beacons across the galaxy that give off a very unique and individual fingerprint? And as you pass through the wormhole, and so you aren't able to navigate yourself throughout the entire time, but you're appearing at some random location in the galaxy, if you have that, if you have that galactic map, and you know, all of all of the pulsars, you could figure out where you are. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're, you're preaching to the choir a little bit here. Because um, uh, I think I think this has a ton of potential. But, you know, if we're thinking about, you know, writing an interesting story, right, this could provide some really nice dramatic pauses while you got to wait a day yeah. for your strap to go figure out where it is, right? Right. You know, scanning and doing some other things. Um, and it takes some time, even for, you know, even if you could collect all the photons coming in, right, it would take some time to resolve these things, um, you know, even with the perfect detector. And and as you wait for all of the pulsar data to come in and you realize you don't recognize any of the pulsars that you're detecting, then you know you you must have jumped too far. And you're in another <laughs> another galaxy. Um, awesome. Well, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. What is the best way for people to follow on your research if they want to sort of keep track of what you're doing? Oh, boy. Um, well, I have a out of date website uh, that they're welcome to look up. Uh, you can there's a link off my department website. Right. It's, uh, See what you were doing years ago. Aerospace.illinois.edu. Yeah. Uh, you know. Um, uh, beyond that, you know, when we when we put out a new study, uh, usually the department has a, a post on, on LinkedIn or yeah. Facebook. Or something like that. Where do you typically publish? Which journals? Ah, um, we usually publish in uh, the IEEE Transactions in Aerospace and Electronic Systems. Okay. Um, if you need some uh, bedtime reading. <laughs> uh, also, the Journals of Guidance Control Dynamics and Journal of Spacecraft and Rockets, which are both um, AAA. Yeah. Publications. So primarily in those three. Uh, on occasion, uh, the uh, Journal of Aerospace Sciences. Do you, do you post to archive first as well? Not usually. No. Okay. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating again talking to you. Uh, I look forward to this little box that gets attached to every spacecraft and tells the uh, the astronauts where they are, or at least the uh, inspiration for some interesting science fiction stories as people are, are watching this, uh, this episode. Thanks, Zach, and good luck with All your right, research. Take care. All right. Good talking. Bye-bye. Thanks. Uh, all right.